Um, all right. We've got about a quarter of the people who are SOP, which I think in meetup terms is pretty good. Um, okay, we had a couple. Uh, first note uh, for if you are going to leave questions or anything in the chat, uh, just a reminder, you can do that, but uh, it goes away. So if uh, if you want, you can use the Hacker Nights channel on, on the Discord. If you're not on Discord, it's at uh, discord.multiprocess.io. Um, for anyone else, if you are interested in, uh, or actually I'll, I'll say that at the end. Uh, yeah. All right. I'm, I'm going to get started because I'm selfish. Um, and I, let me find a timer for myself. And share my screen. All right, uh, my timer's on. Um, so a couple of years ago, there was uh, an awesome blog post. Um, I don't remember who it was by, but they put uh, that old game Snake uh, into a bootloader. And it was awesome and kind of had me thinking about bootloaders ever since then. Um, so the first thing that I'll show all of you is this program. Um, bootloaders are the first thing to run um, in software, as far as I know. I'm not an expert on it. This is just kind of what I learned after like trolling around after a couple of days. Um, this is 80 lines of assembly. And if we compile it with NASM and uh, run it with QMU, uh, this is it, um, which is pretty awesome, 80 lines of code. If you put this onto a floppy, and you had a floppy reader, uh, and you booted to it, it that you know that would be running. Um, so there have been a number of people who who talked about the Hello World version of this, where you literally just print out Hello World, and I'll show you that really quickly. Um, this, uh, if you've ever done any assembly, it will look exactly like any other assembly. Um, all this does here at the top, it says like some clerical stuff about bootloaders. Similarly at the bottom, it pads out the space to 512 bytes because that's how many you need for a bootloader. Um, and then within here, all we do is load this hello world string, loop through the bytes of it until we get to the zero at the end of it and call a BIOS interrupt. So this is, aside from like assembly, the only other magic that I can see in bootloaders is interrupts and they, look almost exactly like syscalls to me. But instead of being handled by the operating system, they're handled by the BIOS. So in this loop, uh, what we're doing is for each byte in that hello world string, we call the interrupt. And this particular interrupt will print out a character to the screen. Um, so if we compile that one and run that one, uh, this is it. Uh, there's a bunch of junk here, but then at the bottom, you can see hello world. That was our string. Um, so the way that you learn about this stuff, there are these, um, there, there's documentation online, just like there is for syscalls, um, for what these interrupts do. And uh, this is one of them. This is not the one that we just used, int 10e. So to, to learn how to program BIOS and bootloaders, you just have to like read through all this documentation about all these functions that come built in. Um, this one is the one that we just used. If you call in 10 passing uh, E in, it will write the character inside the AL register out to display. Um, and if you keep on looking, you'll see that there's an, another set that allows you to read from the keyboard. Um, so 1610. When you call this interrupt, it waits until a key is pressed. And then when it's done, it'll put the ASCII character inside the AL register. Um, so if we go back, the write one writes what is in the AL register and the read one reads into the AL register. So if you put these after each other in a loop, you can make a really dumb editor. Um, so let's look at that for a minute. <laughs> Uh, this looks uh, like, you know, very similar to that hello world that we just showed. Um, here's another interrupt that I, I'm skipping over the 
how it works, but it's just another interrupt that will clear the screen. And then inside of this loop, we call the one interrupt to read a character, and then immediately after, call an interrupt to write the character back out. Uh, and just furthermore, to show that this like actually is doing something, if we comment out the writing part of it, and we run this, I'm typing in, I'm you know hitting my keyboard right now, and nothing's coming out. I'm 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 giving that as a demo just because I want to show that it's not trivial that you get something to both be read from the keyboard and then written back out. So I, I recompiled it right now, and now when I type, it all shows up. Um, but there's some weird behavior here. If I I'm hitting the left key right now, and it's going off to the right. I don't know what that is. I hit the right key, and it also goes off to the right. I hit enter, and it goes back to the beginning. I hit delete, nothing happens. I can overwrite stuff. Um, so just in order to keep on testing my knowledge, I, I said, OK, let's make this a little bit smarter. Let's uh, get it to be able to handle like these common editor shortcuts like backspace and enter. Um, so I culminated my exploration with this like 170 line program that um, at the very top here, the first thing it does is jump to main, which skips past all this helper code. It clears the screen, um, and I'll show you this clear screen. Instead of being an assembly function call, this is a NASM macro, which is pretty cool. So rather than having to do call and ret, you can just call this, and this will get pasted into the program. Um, the zero here is the number of arguments that, that this should get called with. And then inside, oops, uh, inside of this loop, um, we have the main editor action. Uh, so let's go to that code. Inside of the editor action, the first thing that we do is read a character. And then before we get to the print step, we're going to do a whole bunch of stuff. Like, is this arrow keys? Is this backspace? Is this enter? And we're going to handle, handle that kind of thing. Um, so the first thing that we do is we say, is it left down, right, or up? If so, jump to this done label, which is at the very end of this editor action loop, uh, editor action function. Um, the next thing that we'll do is handle backspace. And um, a thing to, uh, if, the more that you explore the BIOS functions, one of the things that BIOS will give you, uh, among many other things, is uh, the, your display will track your current cursor for you. And you can overwrite that. And um, so in here, when we detect a backspace, we have to switch into a bunch of complicated logic that says, like, are you at the beginning of the line? Are you not at the beginning of the line? Um, so here's an example. Uh, if we're not at the start of the line, you need to go backwards one column. So this is going to decrement the column. And then we call set position uh, BIOS interrupt. Like this is a wrapper for a BIOS interrupt that sets the current position based on this register right here. All of this code and that snake code is based on a lot of like implicit, I mean, it's all implicit. Uh, you, you call BIOS interrupts and they make actions based on these registers which is way harder to program in than a normal language where you pass arguments explicitly to a function. But it is what it is. Um, OK, so that's uh, backspace. The next thing is um, handling enter. So right here, we're saying if this is the enter key code, then we'll get the current position, go down a row, move the column back to 0, and then call a set position interrupt. Um, the last thing that I wanted to do is try something a little bit more complicated, which was uh, key combos. And the way that this one works is um, you actually have to move. The BIOS, in addition to having these interrupts that will return a character in a register, also has these areas of memory that you can just check. And it happens that there's a uh, position in memory where um, it will tell you which modifier keys are being pressed when you like hit a combo. So this macro uh, loads up the value and uh, masks to get the third bit. And if that bit is one, then that means that you have pressed control. So that's the basis of this. It all looks, I, I mean, it may look trivial, but this also took me like forever of reading documentation because it's all obscure. Uh, and not that many people are, are doing it and talking about it. Or, or at least not talking about it. Um, yeah, so once we know that the control flag is set, then we just check if like A is pressed with it. If A is pressed with it, we're going to do that read line thing where you jump to the beginning of the line. So set the column to zero and then set position. And then also 
control E. Control E is the opposite of control A in read line or Emacs, it goes to the end of the line. Um, and yeah, that, that's it. So um, the last thing I'll say is that uh, this go to end of line, the way that this works is that it checks the current character and until the character is the ASCII code zero, it keeps on incrementing the cursor and setting the position. This I think is buggy. I, I'm realizing as I prepare for this, because I think that you can't expect that the last character on every line will be zero. It, 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 I think it'll be unprintable, but it won't necessarily be a single ASCII code. Um, and there, like I, I saw the bug way before I figured out what was going on, and I think that's what's going on. Um, so compile that and run it. Again, the the key things here should be that enter works, backspace works, control A works. So if I do ABC, I hit enter, it goes to a new line. GHI, go backspace. Now this is going to this is at the beginning of the line. It's going to be buggy. Uh, yeah. All right, that was totally weird. Um, and I'll just do one more time to show you control A. All right, all right, all right. Um, that was my 10 minutes. Uh, a, B, C, control A goes back to the beginning. D, E, F, G, H, I, control A goes back to the beginning. All right, you get the point. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm done. And uh, any questions? I have one. Nobody else wants to go first. Uh, what happens to that memory location? How many? How much can it hold? Um, as far as like modifiers being pressed with in key rollover, like how how long until it overflows? I uh, there are two parts of that question that I have no idea about. Um, one there there is a uh, circular buffer that holds all the keys that are pressed, but I don't think that applies to the modifier. And so I, so I'm not sure if you were asking about like how many times can you press a key before having read it and having lost it, but then also like how many, what kind of key combos could it detect? Uh, and yeah, the answer to both of those is I'm not sure, but at least it handles control. All right. Um, if anyone else has any other questions, feel free to post it in the uh, chat or the Hacker Nights uh, channel. But uh, happy to move on. Um, Alex, want to go? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Bill. So I'm going to be just recycling some slides from a talk I gave with uh, some coworkers about this topic, same topic. Uh, oh, I don't think I can do screen sharing as a participant. What? Yeah, I'm doing, can anybody else do screen sharing? It says host disabled participant screen sharing. It, sa it says, uh, I just switched it from one participant can share at a time to multiple participants can share. Oh, there we go, yeah, I can do it now. Okay. Cool. All right, can everybody see this? I'll assume, yeah. So yeah, I'm kind of like recycling some slides, so going to be talking about extending C Python to uh, support switch case. So quick second about me, but I work as an SRE now as previously a data scientist, love dabbling in whole infrastructure, machine learning, cryptography, the whole gambit, and especially love Python. Uh, yeah, I'm going to talk about extending C Python explicitly going to be talking about adding the switch and case statements. Um, so I, I did this uh, essentially just to, cause I want to be a better Python programmer and just to show other people that hacking on C Python isn't so scary. And it felt like, uh, I was also reading up on the pep to, um, do like, um, structural matching and kind of like inspired me to, to, to try and do this, um, quick, quick, like disclaimer. So I, I did this like a little bit about like a year ago, maybe a little bit more. And uh, newer versions of Python actually have like a pattern matching construct. And there's also a new uh, parser, new peg parser in Python. So everything I'm going to be talking about here is for Python 3.9, essentially. So keep, keep that in mind. So for those who don't know what switch case is, it's, it's a type of control flow mechanism, very similar to if else. Um, kind of you can think of them very close to each other, just uh, uh, 
a little just just a little bit different, just sort of format a little bit differently. Um, the ideal result I was I was looking for to write it up in Python is something like this, where you have like a switch and a case and sort of an else that else statement makes things look very Python-y. Uh, so I'm not going to be going over just all the internals of C Python and like everything you could modify. I'm just going to be talking about the, the the things I explicitly modified. So this is sort of like the abridged version of what the internals of C Python are. And in green, those are the parts that um, I modified in order to support switch case, specifically about um, AST generation and bytecode generation. Um, and overall, it turns out to be like about 200 lines. So it's like not, not that much in order to implement a language feature. I'm going to be cutting off a few portions. I'm not going to go into like some of the nitty gritty details because it's just like, yeah, it'll, it'll take too long. This is a lightning talk. So the first place you have to start is with the grammar. Uh, so Py Python uh, has a uh, parser generator built, built into it. So with uh, two files, the grammar file and the ASDL file, you those two files basically contain the definition of what the syntax of, of Python looks like. So the first thing we have to modify is just essentially add a little switch statement at the bottom here and just defining what the what the exact keywords are going to look like and it kind of made it very similar to like what a while statement would look like i kind of like based based on my implementation on what the while statement looked like um and also if else so and once we do that we also modify the asdl which is basically um contains uh all the definitions of the nodes and the uh, syntax tree uh, the abstract syntax tree that um, uh, Python generates internally. And with these two files, after you modify them, you Python will do a lot of the magic for you and generate a lot of the fixtures you'll need in order to uh, do some of the later parts, which is which is actually going from uh, abstract syntax tree to bytecode generation, likewise. And I'm going to be talking about a little bit about those two pieces. Um, so I guess I'll just say for reference that for switch and case, you know, we don't have to really define much, just defining like a switch node and a case handler node, and the switch can have multiple case handlers. Um, so the first step is going from the parse tree to the ASD. So once you've modified the grammar file and the ASDL, um, you now need to do sort of this, uh, this um, intermediate representation step where you need to convert the parse tree into the abstract syntax tree. Um, it's not too, too difficult. Um, the parse tree is very rich. And going from one to the other is pretty pretty straightforward. And once you build that tree, sort of like in, in this step, we do a lot of the syntax checking. So if uh, you write switch without a case, we'll like I'll like uh, cancel you right here and just say there's a syntax error and can't have a switch without a case. Um, the next oh so this is like a, an example of once you actually do this um, abstract syntax tree building. Um, we can actually now use some of like the Python inter internal AST tooling to actually be able to parse this code. And we can actually see it now, but it obviously won't execute. Uh, all we have is just this intermediate representation. So now we need to do the next step, which is actually going from the AST to bytecode. So Python is a virtual machine with its own bytecode, um, essentially emulates all this. So uh, going from ASD to bytecode isn't that hard. You there's a lot of internal tooling to be able to um, check yourself and uh, build the bytecode. There's not, not really anything special in, in in this step really. All I'm kind of using is just a jump and a compare operation really, and just copy paste that multiple times. Um, and kind of what that looks like is so, so once you once you do that step of uh, AST to bytecode, you're essentially done. And Python will will run the bytecode happily, um, presuming that your bytecode is, is uh, formatted correctly. So an example of what this code snippet will look like in bytecode is something like this. Uh, all we're kind of doing here is doing like a compare operation. So we only have one case here, and yeah, we're kind of doing that here. And if it's false, we sort of jump we jump to the end of this whole block. Um, yeah, can. I'll leave it for an exercise for the viewer to sort of go through and step through and, and how this and, and how it works just to save some time. 
Um, and yeah, that was pretty much oh, that was pretty much it. All you have to do in order to add a new syntax is just grammar, ASDL, and two functions to create the AST and bytecode. It, it's very very straightforward. It's not like too crazy to 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 add it. I thought uh, I thought I, I was pretty surprised just in how simple how simple and straightforward it was. There's a lot of great like um, reference material online about um, Python internals. Um, like Eli uh, uh, Bendersky, it has like some great blog posts talking about this. Also the also um, the blog post about the Go compiler. Really, really amazing stuff. And yeah, you can get the code on, on my GitHub if you want to take a look. And um, these slides as well are also up on my blog. And yeah, I think I'm way short on time. But if anybody has any questions, yeah, I'll take them now. I have a couple. <clears throat> sure. um, why do you have to modify two files, the ASDL and the EBNF? Is one of them just documentation? Or are they both actually like? They're both needed, yeah. Um, you can't make the, you can't actually like build the AST without modifying the ASDL. How, I don't even understand. How can both be necessary? Um, I think don't 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 quote me on this, but I'm pretty sure that I think it's just a internally like when Python is doing all this uh, um, parser generation tooling, I think it needs both. I mean, I'm sure you can probably hack together a way to sort of skip maybe the AST part and just maybe go straight to Python. But I don't know if that's possible because I think they're they're very much two separate phases. Wait, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm not sure what you're implying. Uh, didn't you say there were two ASDL? Like there's an AS. Oh no, there, there's there's a. Let me go back. There's just a grammar file. Yeah. Um, yeah, which is just EBNF and um, the AS and the ASDL. They 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 have there have to there has to be a correspondence like between them if you want to make a new language feature like okay. this. I guess that's what I'm confused about. Yeah. Is are they not both declarative definitions of the grammar? Is this? Um, no, not necessarily. Oh. This is sort of defining like, yeah, the, the EBNF is just defining like syntax and where things get placed. But um, the ASDL is sort of defining the, uh, the best way I can describe it is like, the way I under, always understood it is just you're defining sort of the, the nodes themselves and the, the, those sort of like data structures themselves, the individual nodes. That you're going to be generating in the AST. I'm pretty sure that that's that's uh, that's how it's used. Somebody can correct me if I'm if I'm uh, misconstruing it. Yeah, that's the way I described it. Basically, protobuf, but for the syntax tree. So you define the data structure and it generates all the code for it. Yeah, but it doesn't define how to parse it. Yeah. Well, it, 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 it generates a parse tree, but you don't get the AST for free. That you that sort of that step you have to do yourself. It still looks redundant to me between the EBNF and the ASDL, but I'll I'll have to go a, a, a little bit. But but yeah, that's that's how it is. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. Thanks thanks for your attention. But I have more questions. Does oh, it you do oh, before? Sorry. If anyone okay. else, what's up? Uh, what's yeah. up? Does it, as you're building it, does it like, do you get uh, warnings about ambiguity all the time or because like, uh, that's fine. You were way under anyway. Uh, like how was your experience extending the grammar? Were there, was there tooling like yelling at you a lot? Uh, because with like some. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like, uh, like example, like there's just like little like synt syntactical things. Like I didn't know like an EBNF just because I was just trying to pattern match based on what what was uh, in grammar that you needed to actually like do this sort of syntax where you needed to do like parentheses and star to say multiple cases. And there's like little things like that. And there's obviously like there was a bunch of seg faults like in the middle where just things didn't parse, just seg fault and you don't know what to do. So I had to whip up GDB to help me with that, to say where I failed. Um, yeah, but what, if you make the grammar correctly, like you can just debug and, and check if things work by essentially running code like this. And just so that if your Python compiles and you can actually get the interpreter up, then you can 
run code like this just to see like, am I parsing right? Or else you'll fail. Yeah. What's the, uh, how, how fast is that dev cycle um, for, for getting a build version of Python and running this code? Um, the step, I'm trying to remember. I don't recall directly how, how long it took, but I know the step from like uh, um, editing the grammar in ASDL was probably like a couple minutes. And then I think everything, everything else beyond that, maybe a couple more minutes. Like it was in the span of minutes when I was running make. Yeah, oh, I guess like, something interesting too is uh, I wasn't able to get faster than if else in Python like this. Um, just there was too many like I guess optimizations and if else I I was like nowhere close. Yeah, for for like some of the same code. I think I have a benchmark actually in in the repo that that, that I do kind of like a crude benchmark. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. I'll stop sharing now and I'll move on to Caleb. All righty. Just go. All right. Can you guys all uh, see the wrong screen, apparently? <laughs> there we go. Um, Nope, mm -mm, still sharing the wrong one. One sec. <laughs> Share this one then. All right, there we go. So uh, today we're going to be bastardizing Ruby's bitwise or operator uh, by me. A little bit about myself. My name is uh, Caleb Albritton. I've been writing Ruby for about 12 or 13 years. And uh, I'm a senior technology, uh, <laughs> sorry, uh, a senior manager of technology at PBS. And uh, so let's, let's get into why. why. Why might we do this? Um, the answer is because why not? honestly. Um, and because I have an affinity for pointy arrows and I started my career in C++ and PHP and I wanted pipelines in Ruby. Um, that's, that's about it. I really, I really wanted this. And uh, yeah, it, it didn't make it into the spec earlier. And there's reasons mostly because um, Matsumoto had a different idea of how it should work than the rest of the community, which is fine with me. I'd rather not get at it at all in that case, which is what happened. Um, but this is the goal right here. We want to be able to pipe some things into another thing and have it come out the other side. Uh, whereas normally this operator would do a bitwise or uh, operation. And in this case, we're, <laughs> we're absolutely not doing that. Um, so how do we get there? Well, did you know Ruby lets you override operators? So we can do something like this, uh, you know, define a singleton method that overrides the pipe operator and uh, take that filter and then call uh, some input on it from the right hand side and continually pipe that down the line so that everything that you end up getting also has uh, a pipe method defined on it. And we just pass that back out. Um, we're going to add a couple of uh, a couple of lines of code at the bottom. So extend class methods is going to allow us to add this method as a static method on top of whatever class includes our library. So uh, let's try to use what we have. If we look at this module um, called talk, uh, it could be a module or a class that includes this pipe uh, bit. We can define some uh, constants. We'll get to that later about why it needs to be, why they need to be defined as constants on a class for a uh, or an object or a module. Um, but they're all lambdas uh, using stabby arrows, of course, as, as I'm enjoying. But it's also really because Ruby operates in lambdas and procs, and that's how you pass around code in Ruby. That's not necessarily a method, and it makes it easier to manipulate. So here, we can have this running, and it continually passes everything down the line. But there's a, there's a couple problems here. What if we wanted to do something uh, like this? Um, where we have a symbol being piped into a thing. Uh, foo, in this case, 
has an arity of two, but we're only calling it with an arity of one here. Uh, so there's there's a couple of problems that's going to happen. When we want to run this, and the first one is not what you think it might be. Uh, in this case, we can't define the singleton method on a symbol uh, or an atom and elixir. It's the it's a little bit with a colon in the front. Um, those things, it turns out, fixed num numbers, uh, floats, and symbol types in Ruby cannot have singleton methods defined at runtime as they are considered immediate values. Um, these immediate values in Ruby don't have anything run against them to produce their value. They just always immediately uh, get returned. And this is a problem as we can't add a pipeline method at runtime to something that never gets executed to have anything run like that anyway. So how do we fix this? Uh, the answer is we're going to wrap the immediate values in a struct that yields the immediate value after it's been operated on with the pipeline operator. Um, so we need to add the open struct and a no op and probably an unwrapper that just points to the no op so that we can eventually get the value out that we want. And so how do we change uh, the singleton method? We're going to change that pipe method to return a wrapped immediate value if we need to wrap it and then define the pipeline as usual. So it's a, <clears throat> that also I left a comment for myself points to the stack overflow that points out that that can't happen. Uh, so we have a wrapped immediate value where we create the new open struct that only has really one property of the value of the input that we've been given. We will take that and add the pipeline uh, operator as a singleton method to the thing we've been given. And if it is the same object ID of the unwrap constant that we made earlier, we're actually going to unwrap that value and simply return the input. And that input is just the bare value and does not have the pipeline operator um, like continually going down the line. So from there, we ask if we need to wrap it if it's a numeric type or a symbol. And that gets us going, but it, it should work now, right? We've got the problem solved of the immediate value. Uh, the answer is still no as uh, we don't have a method of foo defined that has an arity of one. That is still a problem. So let's look back at what we're trying to run again. We have a symbol foo being passed in in line eight to a function foo with an arity of two and only getting one passed into another function wat. Uh, in this case, we're trying to curry foo, but Ruby is trying to execute it as is. Ruby thinks we're calling one and we need one that's two. And this is, here's where I'm going to do a, something very bad. Let's see, Ruby lets you intercept calls to things that don't exist. And foo with an arity of one does not exist. And this is excellent. This is going to let us do some bad things that are very fun. So in this case, on line 11, we're going to implement a method missing that looks up the block of code that we want based on the constant that's been attempted to be called. We're going to fetch that code, check its arity, and if it is zero, we're going to call it. If the arity is equal to the number of arguments that have already been curried, then we're going to splat those arguments and call it. Otherwise, we're going to continue to curry down the line, and the curry is implemented above. Um, it can probably be compacted a bit, but I'm not worried about it. And all of it, all it does is return another lambda, given the input and the arguments that need to be continued down the line. So now. We can run this again and it works. There's a typo. And we'll get WTF barbecue foo bar. And it's wonderful. Um, but we haven't unwrapped anything yet. What if what if we wrapped uh, what what if we ended on a wrapped value? We're actually just gonna get the open struct that we created in the first place. And that's that's probably not what we wanted. We really wanted the value four. And this is pretty easy to solve as we already implemented an unwrap that points to a no-op that dumps out the value that we want. And we're just gonna pipe it simply to the unwrap and out it comes. We have the value four and we have a pipeline operator implemented in Ruby uh, and uh, it works pretty well. I have implemented a static site generator using this uh, pattern and it was very gross and uh, it will never see the light of day, but it was a fun exercise. Um, there's a, a couple of issues that can't be worked around in Ruby to produce this. You will basically always have to do it using uh, Lambda or procedure style code blocks on something that is undefined. That way you can reach out to it 
to overwrite it for the curry. If you're doing it with regular Ruby methods, you'll end up needing to uh, hook in the way a couple of other Ruby libraries do, like Sorbet, which is a Ruby type checker, and decorate the methods yourself in order to be able to produce these code blocks uh, to manipulate them and curry them. Um, implementing it as Lambda functions on uh, static class members was the easiest way to get this working uh, just outright with the smallest amount of code. Um, they have a proof of concept as a gist, which I can share in the chat and in the Discord. Um, and I'll probably do a blog post soon. But uh, let's do questions. Is there not, uh, since you had to have that unwrap at the end, uh, mm -hmm. is there not a way to know that you're at the end of the pipeline, that there's nothing more to be passed? That's a great question. And honestly, something I didn't think about. I'm off the top of my head, I think I probably can tell if there's anything else being passed. Uh, along with the curry, I should be able to know. But I, I honestly, I can't. In my head, I'm trying to think of the implementation. And I can't think of anything right now. So I'll go with maybe. Mm. Could you possibly overload the assignment operator so that if the left-hand side is a pipeline, you unwrap it there? Talking about gross hacks. Ooh, now that's an idea. That could probably work where I reach down and see the entire assignment on the side. I like the way you think. That's a that's a good dirty Ruby idea. I'm gonna try that. I'm also curious, can you put Lambda literals in the pipeline or does it have to? You can, it, you can do Lambda literals, that'll work, yep. Hmm. Go ahead and stop the screen share. All right. Um, thanks, uh, everyone, for sharing it was some awesome and disgusting stuff. Um, uh, yeah, I encourage both uh, Caleb and Alex, and I will put my stuff. Uh, if you got slides or blog posts or anything, put them in the Hacker Nights channel um, so that other folks can see. This is recorded, and I'll put it up on YouTube after this. Um, if anyone else uh, is ever interested in sharing, uh, so long as people, uh, so long as I can keep on finding people interested in sharing weird stuff, um, uh, then we'll keep on doing this uh, once a month. Um, so if you're interested or you think someone else might be interested, feel free to let me know or, you know, whatever. Um, I'm starting to keep a list of, of people like that. I, I want to hear like from Hacker News and Twitter, and I'm starting to email people uh, to see if we can get a mix of like hobbyists and professionals, folks doing database compilers, operating systems, uh, browsers, um, more internals of tech is uh, what I want to see. Um, yeah, thanks everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. Uh, see you around on Discord. Right.